just to start a service with. We were just praying and hearing that we just all come in to your presence, Lord, without fear. We are all part of the family of God. We all come together in the family of God. And the, the Lord watches over us in our communal times as we're here together, but also in our, in our times by ourselves, in our times of preparation before we come in the morning, and also in our day-to-day. It's such a It's such a blessing to realize that sometimes, that the Lord is with us wherever we go, whatever we're feeling. And sometimes you you can walk in the door sometimes at church and think you need to leave all your troubles at the door and come and be worshipful and positive. And sometimes it's just important to know you you can be here as you are. God knows your heart. God, God knows all of our hearts. He knows everything that's going on in our lives. And he wants us to be real and be us and walk into the door exactly as we are. So there's a few more of them coming later on, Um, but I've got quite a lot of notices as well this morning, so I don't want to talk for too long this morning. So first of all, good morning. Lovely to be here. Did anybody watch Eurovision last night? You did. We did as well, um, which I don't know if it's a good thing or not, because our kids, first of all, went to bed at one o'clock in the morning, so they're very tired this morning, and they spent all morning singing, before that wolf eats my grandma, give that wolf a banana which is definitely the strangest sentence I will ever say in church. Um, And I realized to anybody who didn't watch Eurovision last night, that's got no context. It means absolutely nothing. But um, no, we've actually just had a a lovely breakfast service um, over, obviously, at breakfast at nine. We've actually had a couple of Ukrainian families come along. So it was quite a lovely moment to be able to, to, to celebrate that timing with them. So we are, as you all know, in a new chapter of our church at the moment. We are in our interregnum. Uh, Thank you to David, wherever he's gone. He's around. There he is. Thank you for David for kicking it all off last week um, by leading the service then. But there's, it's quite an exciting time as well. It can be a time of strange feelings. We don't really know where you're going yet. But um, it's also a really exciting time to be able to look forward and think, okay, what is next? What is the next chapter that the Lord wants for our church? And what we're really hoping for is for everybody's prayerful input to be included in that. Um, it's, it's a massive part of everything going forward and we are the church we are the body of christ and we want to um all contribute to what's going to happen going forward so you probably already know this but in case you don't already there is a meeting directly after this service in the cmc with the usual refreshments um because nikki and jane are coordinating writing the parish profile which is basically just a a brochure of everything that we are as a church as we are as, as the people of god and Um, that's going to be a crucial part of the recruitment process going forward. And what we'd love you to do is have a think about the answer to three very simple questions um, that we'd like you to answer that would, some of those answers will actually go into the brochure and essentially let a new vicar know what they're letting themselves in for, (laughs) essentially. So um, what we would love is for after the service you to pop over the CMC, there's a whole bunch of post-it notes so you can answer answer these questions. And for anybody who's watching online, hello, Um, You can also get involved. We want your input absolutely as well. So please do either write into the office or phone the office with your answer to these questions as well. We want as many as we can possibly get. We've had some great answers already from our Breakfast at Nine congregation, and we would love the same for you. So the three questions are as follows. So number one, what do you love most about the church? It's quite a difficult one to answer sometimes because there's there's quite a lot you want to know. It's only a little post-it note. Number Number two can't count. What do you think would be the most important attribute or characteristic of the new vicar? And the third one, what are some of the greatest challenges for a new vicar of this church? Essentially, we want to be as open as possible with this process and want as many answers as possible. So if you can, please do stick around, come over to the CMC afterwards, and we will get into that. There is a lot more family news to cover, but I've already spoken for long enough today. So let's look at today's service. And we're actually going to start with the bands of marriage. We've got two bands of marriage, which is always very exciting. Always like doing bands of marriage. Um, So we have, so down it over here. So I'm going to publish the bands of marriage for two couples. So uh, let's look what we have today. So I published the, sorry, I published the bands of marriage between Wayne, John, Paul Critchley, and Joanne Wiltshire of St. Michael's Hamworthy, and this is for the third time of asking today. So if anybody knows any reason in law why they not marry each other, then you are to declare it now. 
few. I don't know what to do if anyone's up, if anyone pops up at that point. And the second one, this one's for the first time. So this is for Thomas James Sullivan and Katie Mary Mary Farrant of this parish. And they are for the first time of asking. So again, if any of you know any reason in law why they not marry, you are to declare it now. Excellent. Brilliant. So looking forward to today's service, we have Mike back today who's pulling double duty because he's already spoken at breakfast on the topic of the big breakfast, which was one of the stories that really inspired breakfast at nine in the first place. So we're looking forward, Mike, to have you have, uh, see what you have to say today. And uh, thank you for coming over and doing, doing two jobs today. Um, yeah, so Lord, we just want to pray for these couples um, as, we, as we go forward um, into their time of marriage. We want to make sure they're blessed and uh, yeah, so, so, so Lord, let's, let's just pray for those, those couples we just mentioned just now. So Lord, we pray for them as they go through their journey towards marriage. We ask that you guide them every step of their preparation and bless and help shape their marriages in your image. Amen. Amen. So we're going to get to our readings and our uh, speak a bit later on, but now we're going to have our first time of worship. So Stephen and Steve are going to lead us in time of worship. Please do stand if you're able. Please stand. Psalm 103 says this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Oh, my soul, my soul. 
so evil. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Please be seated. So we're coming to our time of prayer now. So as we prepare just to hear more of God's word today and bring our lives before him, we're going to move to our time of confession. But let's first say the prayer of, penetra- uh, prayer of preparation to remind ourselves of why we're here together in worship. So almighty God, for anyone following online, this is we're on page two of the Red Book. So we say together, almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We just remind ourselves now of the great commandments and we'll say then our prayer of confession. So our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only God, is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second of it is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. So God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. So let's say these words of confession together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in the newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. So Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now the collect for the fifth week of Easter. Risen Christ, your wounds declare your love for the world and the wonder of your risen life. Give us compassion and courage to risk ourselves for those we serve to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We're now going to move to our readings, so I'm going to invite Anne up to give us our two readings today. Today's reading, the first reading rather, is from Acts chapter 11, starting at verse 1. And it's headed, Peter explains his actions. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying And in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. 
I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord, nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. And then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections, and they praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Uh, now the second reading is from John chapter 21, starting at verse 1. That's headed Jesus and the miraculous catch of fish. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again, again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net wasn't torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Anne. So I'm going to invite Mike up to deliver us his talk on that. But before we do that, let's just pray for Mike and for us as we hear his word today. So Lord, we thank you that once again you go before us. We thank you that you've gone before Mike and you've given him words to say to reach all of us. And Lord, we pray for open hearts. We pray that the words Mike will speak, that you will give him to speak to us now, reach those corners of our hearts and speak to us in a, a new way today, Lord. Bless each one of us as we hear these words and bless Mike as he delivers them. Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Well, it is... Um, can people hear me? 
Is the microphone on? Brilliant, thank you. It's, um, it's great to be here this morning and uh, lovely to see such a full church. Can I, can I just ask, is there anybody here who's, who's here for the first time or the first time in a long time and haven't been for a while? Can you just raise your hand just so I can see? Because if Chris were here, he'd know instantly, but I, I, um, I, I wouldn't. But um, if that is the case for anyone, um, welcome back. It's certainly the fullest I've seen this church. I, will, well, I don't know, Chris is leaving service is quite full as well. But um, he had family to add to that number as well. But it's great to be here. It's brilliant to see everybody playing their part. Isn't Pete leading brilliantly? And Stephen on the worship. And we've got the AV and Anne's done the prayers. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's lovely to be here and see the church family working so well. You know, um, the other morning as I begin, I just want to reflect on this. On Thursday morning, I took our dog for a walk. Some of you may know I've got a dog, um, Auburn, the cockapoo. And uh, he made a, uh, I was, wasn't planning to come down to the river, but he, um, he made a dart that way. And I said, oh, OK, we'll come down to the river. And it was a beautiful sunny morning on Thursday. I don't know if you remember. Um, and I came down. I, I went down to across the bridge, footbridge, and went to the other side of the river. And I just sat um, overlooking the weir. You probably know exactly where I mean. You probably sat there yourself or stood there yourself. I just had this little moment um, with the Lord, so to speak. I was just um, praying a bit. And as I looked out over Camford and back this way, I um, was praying for all of you. And, um, and then I looked down to the river and I saw, again, you'll be very familiar with the scene, the, the water just rushing down that weir and splashing over at the bottom. And, and I had this, this verse came to mind. I'll remind you of the verse from Lamentations and I'll, I'll explain why God spoke to me through this as I looked at that scene. You'll know this this uh, it's probably about the only positive verses in Lamentations, but um, <laughs> Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. As I looked at this scene, it was like I was looking at a very ancient scene. Like lots of people would have sat in that place for many years, and it, it would have looked largely the same as the water tumbled down and crashed over and the beautiful scene up to camp. In many ways, that scene's probably not changed very much for a very, very long time. Some things never change. But at the same time, in every moment, with every splash of every drop of water, there was dynamism. Every moment was actually completely unique. Change and dynamic was happening all of the time. Every splash was different. Every, if you looked at it in fine, if you had one of those slow, those long exposure photos, everything would have seemed smooth and exactly the same. But if you have a snapshot of just the split second, everything would have been different and new in that moment. Do you see what I mean? And there was life everywhere. And the birds were singing and there was the rush of the water. I took a little video so I could capture the sounds and the dynamic of the moment. And again, it made me reflect, you know, here at this church, I had a similar reflection at Chris's last service. Some things never change. This church has stood here for centuries. The word of God has been preached here for centuries. The people of God have gathered and worshipped and prayed for centuries. But also, God is forever bringing life and doing new things. Every moment is different. And actually, life is dynamic. It's changing every moment, isn't it? And that's to be celebrated because God's constancy, his faithfulness is always there. He's always bringing new things. That water rushes because he wills it and brings life to it. You look through the surface of the water and there's new growth in the spring underneath the water. In, in this church, some things never change, but also everything's changing all the time. I just found it a great comfort for me, just in that moment, just little old me, to reflect on both of those things and to find strength in that. Great is God's faithfulness, his blessings are new every morning, his compassions never fail. Great is his faithfulness. Now this morning, from uh, the reading, particularly in, in, in John 21, the big breakfast, I'm primarily going to reflect on, but we'll touch on the Acts 11 reading as well. I think we have a hugely significant moment for Peter and his discipleship. Of course we do. This is like, 
I made the analogy in the breakfast at nine service. This is like almost like his wedding breakfast. It's funny we call it a wedding breakfast because it's often in the evening, the meal, isn't it? But it's because it's the first meal of a whole new phase of life, isn't it? That's why we call it a wedding breakfast. There's a sense in which this is, this is Peter's wedding breakfast with the Lord, as it were. His life's never going to be the same after this breakfast. And, and the things that we pick up, the journey that Jesus takes Peter on in this narrative, if we dig underneath the surface, is just beautiful and I hope to illuminate just some of those things which you may well already know but afresh this morning to you Uh, and I also think it's particularly significant because as we reflect on those lessons I think we'll see the application for for us as a church this morning too so let's um let's have a look with me in John chapter 21 if you have a bible in front of you or you've got a device in which you fire it up on them do follow with me but in uh, John chapter 21 we have this uh, famous scene, this famous narrative. In verses 6 to 7, this is what we read. Jesus says, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some, some fish, which they've been no luck in fishing. Uh, When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. By the way, I love that someone counted them afterwards. One hundred. We, we need the detail people. In an interregnum, we need the detail people. Thank God for the treasurers and the counters and the detail people. Um, they get their moment in this. 153. Um, uh, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, that's John, said to Peter, um, It is the Lord! As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off and jumped into the water. Now, why is that significant? Because the first thing that Jesus does here for Peter, remember, of course, this is post-resurrection, but it's also post-crucifixion. It's post-Peter letting Jesus down. It's post the Last Supper, where they last shared a meal together. Okay, so keep all of that in your mind, because they get threaded into this story. But the first thing that Jesus does is he reminds Peter of his call, his purpose, his identity. He takes him back to his call. You find a narrative of this in Luke chapter 5. And John remembers this. See, when this miracle happens, not for the first time, where there's a large catch of fish, John goes, it's the Lord, because he remembers he's done this before. And you'll know the story at the call of the disciples. And what does Jesus say at that moment to Peter? He calls him to follow him and he says, I'm going to make you what? A fisher of men. And so this moment after the resurrection and Jesus knows he's about to return to the Father, the first thing he does with Peter in a beautiful way is he reminds him of his call and his purpose. This is who you uniquely are and who I've called you to be. And I know what's happened over the last few weeks, but this is what I'm calling out of you afresh and again. This is your call. This is your purpose. This is your identity. You're called to be a fisher of men. You're the rock on which my church will be built. And he reminds Peter in the most beautiful, gentle way of his call. Do you see? That must have meant a lot to Peter at that time. And this is how I think it's applicable to us as a church in an interregnum. You see, we are in an interregnum. We are between vicars. But the call on this church has not changed for centuries to proclaim the gospel afresh to each and every generation, to, to love God, to love one another, to love our community. And each of us individually, as members, as body, members of the body of Christ in this place, will have a call and a purpose in this season and into the future. It's so important for each of us individuals to ask in this season, not, not just to kind of go, oh, well, I hope, I hope we survive until the new vicar comes in, but to say, Lord, what are you calling me to in this time? Or what particular shape and gifting, the way that I know you've made me, can I bring to serve to build up your church in this time? To be intentional about that, I encourage you. I know you'll be, you're a very prayerful bunch. I know you'll be praying. But pray and love and serve and support one another. God, how can I help? Uh, the wardens, I'm sure, will love to hear that from time to time. Not all the time, they might get fed up. But to be able to say, how can I help? How can I be praying? We all need to play our part in that. And all of us have a call in this season and into the future. That's the first thing that Jesus does. He reminds Peter of his call. And for us as a church, and as we put together this parish profile, we need to be reminded as a church too, what is our purpose and our call? 
That hasn't changed. Do you see? The second thing that Jesus does, also hugely important, is he reminds Peter of his failure, of his weakness, in a subtle but very deliberate way. So read with me um, verse, from verse 9 uh, of this reading, 21, verse 9. When they landed, when all the disciples landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Now, if you were to turn back a page, as I am now, to John 18:18, 18, 18, it says it was cold, and the servants and the officials stood round a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Do you know what happens next in that chapter? Peter denies Jesus three times. I almost get emotional thinking about the emotion. Peter's dripping wet from the water of the Sea of Galilee, but I can only imagine at this point there's some tears rolling down his cheek too. Jesus has put him again, warming himself around a fire. Now, we, we didn't live this, but imagine how vivid that must have been for Peter. How viral, how alive, that tangible moment. Jesus again by the fire. One gospel account says that after he denies him three times that he catches Jesus' eye. And here he is sat the other side of a fire again, warming himself, looking Jesus in the eye. Can you even imagine? And so what Jesus does is he takes him to Peter's greatest moment of weakness and of failure. When we realise that we have nothing to offer God, like none of the, Jesus already had the fish, I don't know if you noticed that detail, he already had some fish he was cooking, he didn't even need the fish that Peter caught. But he invites him to contribute some fish, he doesn't need him, really important, Jesus doesn't need you but he loves you and he wants you. That's much more powerful. You're not a tool to him. You are a loved one to him. He doesn't need your fish or whatever you have to offer. He can make 153 out of nothing. (laughs) But he wants your fish. So he calls Peter around this fire. It reminds him of his weakest moment and of his greatest failure. And, And it's a moment of great humbling, I expect. For Peter. There's a sense in which all of us need to be reminded that we don't have anything to offer Jesus, and in fact, we've let him down. We need his mercy and his grace. Peter must be just like, I remember, as he warms himself by the fire, I know. Almost unable to look Jesus in the eye, maybe. I'm just trying to put myself in the scene. It's so important for us as individuals to be taken back in reflecting on our call to that moment of humility and weakness where we know we've got nothing to offer Jesus. The the rags of our mistakes and failures. I I sometimes find this in, in my call as a vicar. Every now and then I just have to just go back to the cross and just go, I've got nothing. This is all grace. This is all mercy. This is all you. And for us as a church, for this church, as a parish church in this time, in an interregnum, I think there's a lesson here as well, because this church isn't perfect. (laughs) It's wonderful. If it were perfect, though, you wouldn't need a new vicar. We'd just let you crack on. (laughs) Hands up if you think you're perfect. (laughs) Of course you're not. No church is, and no one is. And Peter isn't, and you and I aren't, and this church isn't. And so we do need a new leader and a new vicar for a new season, not because they're going to make us perfect, because they're not (laughs) they'll bring their own issues but because 
because God has ordained that in that way in his church, that people with particular call are called out of the church community and to church communities to try and lead them in the ways of Christ and, and into new things. And to be able to, as a church in this time, take a mature view and go, well, what are our weaknesses? Where do we actually need more help? What shape of a vicar would be good to come in? I encourage the subcommittee as they're reflecting on the parish profile. Don't be afraid to name your weaknesses because actually that's what gives a prospective vicar coming in a bit of space to go, oh, they're not perfect. They know their weaknesses and I might be able to help with that. I might actually be shaped. Do I have some experience I can bring to bear on that? It's actually a very good thing to mention the weaknesses. It was very important when I was looking at the Lantern parish profile to go, oh, oh, I've got some experience that might be able to help this church family there. Oh, I, well, I, I've got my witnesses, but I might be able to help with that. And so it's going to be really important for us as a church as well to be open, undefended with our weaknesses at this time. Uh, and why is it a safe thing to do that? Because of the last point. So, last of all, Jesus reminds Peter in that moment of his, his love his undeserved grace and mercy because even taking Peter to that moment of his greatest weakness there was the invitation again to fellowship to breakfast to a meal which in that culture meant everything about your acceptance that you're loved and welcomed and so despite the fact Peter recognises he has nothing to offer and he's welcomed in he's loved there's a smile on Jesus' face. You'll know in the subsequent verses, Jesus reinstates him again into that call. But he had to take him via the weakness and the sin first. We all need to redo that journey repeatedly in our discipleship. But it is extraordinary what Jesus does here. You see, Jesus, these are the verses 9 to 13. I'll just read a bit more of the narrative as we have this last last reflection when they landed they saw fire burning coals there with fish on it and some bread some bread Jesus said to them bring some of the fish you've just caught not that he needed them because he already had some so Simon Peter climbed back into the boat dragged the net ashore it was full of large fish 153 but even with so many the net was not torn Jesus said to them come have breakfast none of the disciples dared ask him who are you they knew it was the Lord Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. I did the same with the fish. How would the disciples not also have been thinking of the Passover meal and the Last Supper as he took the bread and gave it to them? They were reminded of everything that he'd done for them. This is my body, he said that night. It was broken for you. This is my blood, which is given for you. We're about to celebrate that now. He's, he's renewing all the disciples in this, this love feast. Do you know that's what the early Christians called communion. They called it agape. There's the word agape feast, an agape meal. And simply that means a love feast. What he's doing here with Peter and the disciples and to all of us is inviting us again into his love, despite our weaknesses. And you see, as Christians, as a church, when we realise that we have nothing to offer God and we've failed him and yet he welcomes us in, that changes everything. That's the Christian gospel. That's what he's doing with Peter here before he can send him off to be the rock on which he will build his church. And before this church embarks on its new chapter and its new season, searches for a new vicar and a new leader and to the new things that God's calling them to do. And there will be new things, just as there was in Acts 11. New unexpected things and people who are far from Christ yet to reach, who will be welcomed in because God is already drawing them in. The Spirit of God is already speaking to Cornelius and his family and those in the future in this community who will draw to himself. So we knew things, and surprising things. This was shocking. To what Peter says, surely not. <laughs> surely this isn't right. I can't eat, kill and eat this. We can't. But the Spirit of God was leading in new ways and new things to reach new people with the gospel. Peter's learning all the time, we are all learning all the time, but it begins with this breakfast. That was the first breakfast of the rest of his life. It begins with this breakfast. <laughs> Re-begins for all of us. 
as I close. Um, do you know who I mean by George Herbert? He's a Welsh poet and priest. Amazing poet. And he um, wrote a beautiful poem. You may have heard it before. It's called Love Bade Me Welcome, which is a, a kind of a reflection piece on all we've just said um, just now. So listen in to this. See if you can... It might be helpful, just close your eyes and just try to listen to words because you can't read it in front of you. And when, just if it helps, the personification here, when it says love bade me welcome, he means Jesus bade me welcome. He's personifying love in Jesus. Love bade me welcome. Yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, oh my dear, I cannot look at thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. No, you must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Jesus, we thank you again for this beautiful reflection on this gospel, this profound meal as it was for Peter and can be for us every time we celebrate this love feast which you prepared for us, your body broken for us, your blood shed for us. And so I pray even now as we shortly come to receive communion that there would be a journey like that for Peter, for each one of us, for this church, as we remind ourselves of your call on us in this church, as we remind ourselves of our weakness, of our poverty before you, we have nothing to offer you, and yet you give us everything in your grace and love, and you welcome us in love, bade us, welcome, draws us in. And we praise you, and we give you glory, and we thank you. Amen. Thank you, Mike. It's a, it's a beautiful image of newness. It's a beautiful image of dynamism and new things happening all the time. Um, I've had the pleasure of watching Mike do two versions of the Big Breakfast talk this morning, and it just strikes me how that newness is reflected in the differences between different steps of the journey. At breakfast this morning, we had one family who was coming back for their second ever service and two families that were there for the very first time. But when Mike said at the start of his talk today, has anybody not been here in a long time? I don't think anybody put their hands up. But that doesn't matter. Because there is still newness coming in with every step. There are new plans ahead. We had a word in our pre-service prayers that faith is like a staircase. It's like steps going up to the unseen. And our job is to walk up those steps. And if we walk up those steps without Jesus, we're going to slip but Jesus is going to hold our hands. And if we take him by the hands, like he took Peter by the hand, he will walk with us and he will prevent us from slipping. And if that sounds frightening sometimes, you know, anxiety is a real thing, but the joy of the Lord is our strength. And anxiety robs us of that joy, but Jesus says, take no anxious thoughts. He is the rock on which to build our life. And there was one more word as well, uh, related back to the water again that uh, there was a picture of a boat on the water but the water itself was the Holy Spirit the water holding the boat up was the Holy Spirit that we are held up by that Spirit by the power of that Holy Spirit our weakness has absolutely nothing on the power of the Holy Spirit 
So now I just can invite Stephen Ban to come up and lead us in a bit of time of reflection. Following on from Mike's talk, this is a song of submission to Christ and commitment to him. We bow our hearts. Shall we stand?
please take a seat. So we're going to have our time of prayer with Nikki in just a moment, but just before that, Mike has something else to, 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 to mention. Um, yes, uh, I, our prayers are going to be led by um, Nikki in just a moment, but I just wanted to make sure everybody here was aware that uh, Sandra Webster is now probably in her last days um, with us. I um, got a message uh, from her daughter, Nick Deacon, on Friday to say that the doctors had said she might not even um, be with us beyond the weekend. And so I went over on, on Friday evening and um, uh, checked that she knew who I was. She did, she's all switched on up here. She was, she was a bit slow to speak, obviously, and she's weak. But I said, do you know who I am? She said, you're Mike. Um, and uh, very clearly. And then um, and I said, do you know why I'm here? And, uh, and uh, she, said, she said, yes, I'm really not very well. And, um, and I said, yes, the, the, the doctors have said, you might not have too long before you go and meet Jesus. And, uh, and whilst everything in her response had been a bit slow to that point, when I asked the next question, she was sharp as a button. And I just said, are you looking forward to meeting Jesus? Yes, she said. As she turned to me, looked me in the eye, yes, she can't wait. Uh, we reminisced, we chatted, we read some psalms, we prayed, I anointed her with oil. And um, uh, Nick and Paul were there at the time and um, her son was arriving later, I think. So I just wanted you to know in case you had picked up on the grapevine that um, I'd been to visit, one of us had been to visit and to prepare her. Um, Chris knows too, um, he's traveling back from Israel today, he'll be arriving back at midnight, and uh, if she's still with us, he will go and see her um, tomorrow morning, he said. Um, uh, um, but whether he does or he doesn't, however long left in this world, Sandra knows where she's going, and she cannot wait to meet Jesus. And that is a cause for praise, even in a difficult moment, isn't it? I'm going to hand over to Nikki, and she's going to lead us in prayers. Let us pray. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Our loving Heavenly Father, we worship you. Wonderful Jesus, God's Son, we thank you that you give us springs of living water welling up to eternal life. Holy Spirit, we beseech you to cleanse and refresh us that we may be a blessing to others. We pray for the church throughout the world, asking that all archbishops and bishops and all church leaders will listen to your voice and seek unity. We pray for our archbishops Justin Welby and Stephen Cottrell and ask that they may have strength, vision and courage as they seek to lead us. We commit to you our new Bishop Stephen Lake and pray that he will be guided by and filled with your spirit. Let us lift before God our own clergy, praying firstly for Chris and Sandra as they begin this new phase of their lives, and then for Mike and Karen and Peter Myers at St. Barnabas. Give them all wisdom, love, hope, and joy, and fill them hour by hour with your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we pray for our own church during this time of interregnum. We ask for a spirit of unity, joy and peace to be at the heart of all our activities. 
we commit to you all the preparations for the parish profile, that the choice of a new vicar will be according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, we pray that you will guide our Queen and our government, that they may seek justice and the good of all. We pray for our war-torn world and particularly lift before you the Ukraine. We pray also for the Yemen, Afghanistan, Syria, Ethiopia, the DRC and other countries where wars are waging. Let us remember before God all the suffering people. We pray for an end to these conflicts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray now for our own communities, particularly thinking of those who are in need, those in poverty, the vulnerable, the sick in body, mind or spirit, and the isolated. We pray earnestly for Sandra Webster and her family. Please be particularly close to Sandra at this moment and give her your peace. Comfort her family, we pray. We thank you for her and all that she has given to this church. May she find fullness of joy in your presence. We bring before you all those who are bereaved and think today of the families of Liz Hawkins and Uta Wells. We pray that they may be comforted. We offer all these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. come now to communion and uh, we will be using prayer H which I hope you can find on page I think it's 38 in your books the Lord be with you and also with you lift up your hearts let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced... Sorry, the words there. Sorry, there we go. <laughs> That's right. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. 
at the end of supper, taking the cup of wine. He gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Turning back to page 12, we say together the Lord's Prayer. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. So, friends, draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts, by faith, with thanksgiving. Now, as you come forward to receive, uh, I think you might probably familiar, if you've all been here before, but if you just come up the middle um, to here, and I will, um, I'll take the the wafer and I'll dip it in the wine. If you just hold your hands out in front of you, that just gets an extra measure to try and minimise contact. So just hold it and then I'll drop the two elements into your hands. And I think for most of us, do you, do you then still go up here and back round to your seats? You know what to do, um, better than I do, so do that.
there will be some time of prayer at the end there'll be some time of prayer after the service if you like but if you'd like to go for prayer during communion you can also can the prayer team are ready down in the south chapel wonderful problem to have but we've run out of wafers and so we're just getting the right keys to get to them and we'll get there. Um, why don't I suggest we worship and uh, when the wafers arrive please those who haven't yet received just come up during the worship whilst we're worshiping is that okay and we'll get to it so just have a seat right there if you want and then we'll be ready but should we stand and we can worship together. I stand amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazareth and wonder how he could love me, a sinner. Stand amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazareth, and wonder how He could love me, a sinner. Oh, 
the burden to Calvary and suffer and die alone. How marvelous, how wonderful that my son shall ever be. together the prayer that follows communion. I think it will probably appear on the screen for us um, too. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Please take a seat again. So we've got some more family news. I did tell you there'd be a lot today. So first of all, just a reminder of the meeting that we're going to have just over this. We've got those three questions. Um, and get thinking about the challenges for a vicar. It can be something deep and theological, or it can be just a case of make sure you've got the right keys for the wafer cupboard when you run out of wafers. Um, so please do, please do. Uh, it's wonderful to have our church warned. <laughs> Who knew that was in your job description? Um, we also really want this whole period of time to be soaked in as much prayer as possible. And I know Bev and June are going to be leading um, a series of prayer meetings. So the first one of these prayer meetings is on the 9th of June, which is a Thursday at 11 o'clock. Now, uh, if you can make it to that time, fantastic. It's also going to be on the first Thursday of every month after that, at the same time, I believe, 11 o'clock? 11 till 12. 11 till 12 on each of those Thursdays. Where is it going to be? In the CMC. Perfect. So if you can make it to that, fantastic. If you can't make it to that, um, please do either take that time wherever you are to just stop and have a few moments of prayer but also we would really love it that the life groups just take out a few minutes each week to also add their own prayer we really want this whole process to be covered in as much prayer as possible um, the other thing we have Christian Aid Week coming up um, there's going to be a short act of worship on the Minster Green in Wimborne this coming Friday the 20th at midday to mark that and also at the back today we have these envelopes for Christian aid so do potentially pick up one of those on the way out um, I think that's it for notices but there were a lot so I might have missed one does anybody have any other notices that I should have mentioned wow okay <laughs> fantastic in that case let us stand to sing our final hymn tell out my soul
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Stephen and Steve. I did forget something. I meant to mention that if any of the words in the service, anything that Mike has said, anything that's come out in the prayers, anything that's come out in the words, anything that you've just heard yourselves or felt yourselves that you want to come forward for prayer, please do come forward. There is a prayer team in the South Chapel waiting. We'd love to pray for you and with you. Um, and if anybody is online and um, has anything, please also do get in touch with us. We want to do the same for you as well. Now I'll invite Mike back up for our final blessing. And then you're going to do the dismissal bit. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Great. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.